It's legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> This is last one? This would be available after any of you. That's mine. Okay. If you miss anything or you didn't pick it up. Did he get one? <laughs> Tom? No, I don't have one. Mr. President, could you give us a little advance word on your uh, arms talk proposal? Uh, which one of you <laughs> <laughs> really caught here? This is a, a photo opportunity, but. Uh, it's up to you. Do you, do you yeah, we're to work, Mr. Right? She can tell us that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really can't uh, on that. I mean, I can't give any uh, advance word. Yeah. Are you prepared to proceed with deployment of uh, Pershing and cruise missiles beginning in the, at the end of this year? We've never retreated from our position that uh, uh, we are going to deploy on schedule. Yeah. Uh, and it, uh, it is true. That I will be speaking to the NATO ambassadors uh, tomorrow and at that time making a statement about uh, this whole matter. Could I just volunteer that a lot of the speculation that I've been reading, however, is uh, we have, yes, we've been in consultation and as we promised from the very first in this administration that we would be on everything with our NATO allies, but um, uh, there has been no change in my position or ultimate goal. So you are going to go forward with deployment? Deployment, I've said, we've never retreated from that, Okay. yes. Right. Regardless of what you tell us tomorrow, it seems like judging from your past statements and the statements of some of your advisors, any sort of a, of a deal would involve the dismantling of some SS-20s on the part of the Soviet Union. Is there any reason to believe the Soviets were at all interested in that sort of a deal? Can Mr. Andropov get his generals to buy off on that sort of an arrangement? Well, there is one thing you have to remember that, uh, as they themselves uh, made public, that uh, while they made a, a proposal that we could not find acceptable, it was based on their making a sizable reduction in the number of their missiles. Mr. Mr. President. Mr. President, while we're on the subject of arms control, we seem to be entering a period of a new Cold War with the Soviet Union, with the escalation, with the uh, rhetoric escalating on both our side and their side. In that sort of atmosphere, is it realistic to think we can reach any sort of arms control agreement? Yes, I've seen this, these remarks also as to the return to a Cold War. Um, we are in, we remain in communication with them. And uh, the very fact that we're sitting in three separate negotiating uh, tables with them on three uh, different subjects of disarmament, um, I don't think there's anything particularly new in the, uh, the rhetoric that was used by Andropov and has been used by other Russian leaders uh, before him. Uh, in the United States, we have to be used to being called imperialists and uh, uh, several other things. and. Uh, charges made that um, uh, we're trying to seek some advantage or something. Uh, I don't think there's really been any escalation of that at all. Of course, there, some critics would say there has been escalation on your part in recent speeches in calling the Soviet Union an evil empire and, and some of the language that you've used. Do you think that's done any harm in the effort to reach an agreement with the Soviet Union? No. I think the thing that I said in speaking to that audience was that in pointing out on the basis of the comparison of our two social structures or our, the traditions and uh, what our ideologies were that uh, in contrast to what we viewed as proper, uh, 
religious freedom and even belief in religion and in a God as contrasted to their own uh, anti-religious uh, position, their own uh, refusal to believe in individual rights and so forth. Uh, uh, I didn't think that uh, there were many polemics in that, in that particular uh, message. Mr. Mr. President, back to the uh, interim uh, proposal that you're going to make tomorrow without asking you to reveal the details further. I'd like to ask a little bit about how we got there because as recently as your last press conference in the East Room, which was the 16th of February, you rather firmly uh, rejected any idea of an interim proposal. Both Larry Barrett and I asked you questions and, and, and you indicated that you were not at all, uh, did not at all intend to make any new proposal, that if it was an interim proposal, it would have to come from the other side. What's changed to lead you to change uh, uh, that? Uh, well, I think when you refer back in that other question, uh, and the way it came at the time, had to do with uh, asking things that would have required me to state in advance negotiating positions. And uh, I've had a lot of years' experience in negotiating uh, before I was ever in public life. I negotiated for about a quarter of a century uh, the basing contracts of our union, the Screen Actors Guild, with management. And you don't you can't talk about negotiating positions because if you do, then they're no longer uh, positions. You've compromised your, your own strategy. And this is what uh, uh, caused me uh, and has caused me in the past to make answers about uh, that you're really making the answer with the knowledge that the other fellow is going to, going to read it or, or hear it. Well, are you saying you uh, were headed in that direction but just didn't want to? Well, I want to, I want to point out that, and by real intention, Back when I made, at the press club, public, the first statement about the zero-zero option, I very specifically said that we would negotiate in good faith on any legitimate proposal. Now, we had stated our goal and what it was that we would like to have, but I made that other statement deliberately uh, so that it would not be taken uh, by everyone has, well, a complete take it or leave it a proposition. In that instance, then there is no negotiation. Uh, they either uh, give in or, uh, or you go home. So uh, to that extent, uh, I don't think that, uh, well, let me just put it this way. We've made no change in our ultimate goal. But beyond that, I can't speak before tomorrow. One, uh, on that same subject, Mr. President, uh, do you subscribe to the view uh, held by some European uh, leaders and by some in your own administration that the Russians won't bargain uh, 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 in earnest until um, we deploy the Persian and cruise missiles in Europe? Well, I believe that one of our problems in the past and why during a period, a decade or so in the 70s, when we were unilaterally disarming, uh, and they were at the fever pitch in the rebuilding, or the building of probably the greatest buildup of military strength in world history, that one of the reasons why uh, there was no prospect, if you will remember, uh, President Carter uh, sent his Secretary of State to make an arms reduction proposal in Moscow, and he was home in 48 hours. And I have always felt that there's no reason for the other side to negotiate if they're out ahead and we are apparently disarming ourselves without asking any uh, compensatory reduction on their part. And I believe that the reason we have three negotiating teams uh, now at three different tables negotiating with them has been our determination uh, over these more than two years uh, to refurbish our own our own military and uh, I've said before I, I think it was summed up in a cartoon about the late Leonid Brezhnev uh, when he was cartooned in one of your publications uh, the cartoonist had him speaking to a Russian general and he said I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it uh, I think that you have to if you're going to negotiate, you have to have some strength on your side. You have to have some reason 
for them to look at and weigh the value of reducing uh, uh, their own weaponry. Mr. President, on that general subject of uh, defense, won't your plan to develop anti-missile weapons in outer space set off a new round in the arms race? Won't it just be a destabilizing force? I think to the contrary. I think that, and I, I try to make it as plain as I could in that address. I've been amazed at some of the uh, fevered rhetoric in editorials that I've been reading, and uh, I think some of them are quite irresponsible. But um, no, the, I made it plain that we are going to continue, and I am determined to continue as doing everything I can to persuade them that legitimate arms reduction is the only path to follow. That to look down to an endless future with both of us sitting here with these horrible missiles aimed at each other and the only thing preventing a holocaust is this to so long as no one pulls the trigger. This is unthinkable. In my opinion, if a defensive weapon uh, could be found and developed um, that would reduce the utility of these or maybe even make them obsolete, then whenever that time came, a president of the United States would be able to say, now we have both the deterrent, the missiles, as we've had in the past, but now this other thing that has altered this. And he could follow any one of a number of courses. He could offer to give that same defensive weapon to them to prove to them that there was no longer any need for keeping these missiles. Kind of a or twist, with sir. that defense, he could then say to them, I am willing to do away with all my missiles. You do away with all of yours. But do you, what would you expect the Soviets to do in this period while we are developing this weapon? They're not just going to sit idly by and, and let ourselves, uh, let the United States make itself invulnerable to their missiles. On the other hand, I think that there's every indication that they've been embarked on this same kind of research themselves. Mr. President, you said that some, some of the editorials that you had read criticizing your new defensive initiative had been irresponsible. How have they, what, what did you mean by that? How irresponsible? Well, oh, there, I've just been reading a collection of them over there. There have been uh, charges that this was a, a smokescreen on my part uh, to um, avoid a discussion of the arms buildup. There have even been some of them have charged that in my speech the other night on television uh, that I did not give any facts, uh, that I obscured the truth. Well, I think those charts were <laughs> pretty factual and based on actual count and actual figures. Um, other statements that, um, that I was proposing something that never was and never could be uh, a defensive weapon. And I had to remember that Vannevar Bush, one of our truly great scientists, was asked by President Eisenhower with regard to the feasibility of creating a missile in which the delivery of an atomic weapon uh, could be by missile. And uh, this great scientist, after his own study, said to the President that the image of a missile that could be launched from a silo, pre-targeted on a target in another, on another continent, just was an impossibility and could never happen. Well, today the thing we're talking about are thousands of those on both sides of the ocean targeted on each other. And uh, so for someone to say that what I was talking about was a fairy tale, they even used that term, that it could never take place, I think is irresponsible. Mr. President, can I ask you just one question about that, that program that you announced last week? The cost, the cost of it. Everybody seems to be sort of moving around it. Nobody's really getting into what it's going to cost. So we spend a billion dollars, but we don't know what it's going to cost in the out years. One, do you know what it's going to cost in the next few years or what kind of money's been put aside for it? And two, because of the trouble you've been having on the Hill with the defense budget as it is being too high, why should the, the Congress go along with approving a program like this? It's going to cost a lot more money, presumably. Do you, have a, do you have a cost figure on it? No, because, first of all, this is not a crash program. There, I think you would have to have as such, well, a crash program was the development of the atom bomb. 
in wartime. Uh, I have said, I don't know how long this would take. I don't know what direction that research would go. Uh, to all of those who also editorialize that this was truly outer space and so forth. I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But, but to start, but you, sir, you're going to have to put some money with it. What kind of money are yes, you going to put Yes, well, with? we already have about a billion dollars that is in the budget for research in the defense budget now, and some of that would be diverted to this research. Now, you would have to see what direction this took and what was needed to further that, uh, that research. But I don't think that it would be the, the tremendous immediate cost that a crash program uh, would be. You mentioned just a minute ago, Mr. President, that some future president might have the option of providing this defensive weapon to the Soviets if he so chose. Uh, what about some sort of an interim arrangement now? Uh, do you think there's any merit to the idea of some sort of a joint venture where the United States might be willing to share the research data on this system with the Soviets so that uh, to, to reduce any chance of, uh, of uh, escalating tensions in this area? I have to tell you, I, I haven't given that any thought. Uh, that's something to think about uh, uh, and look at. And incidentally, Gary, uh, uh, as for our defense budget being too high, I think your paper editorialized that it isn't. Well, that may be, sir, but I, you know, but the Congress has to vote on it, and, I, and, and I'm still curious on what you think, you know, the congressional reaction will be to a program like this that some have said, including the speaker and others, that is pie in the sky. You know, why should we vote for, you know, funding for a program like this? They're going to be called on to do it, and, uh, you know, you can propose it, but uh, uh, they may dispose of it as fast as you do that. Well, I would assume that it would take the same place uh, in the budget. It would be part of the in every defense budget there is a, a sum, as I've said before, there's already in this one about a billion dollars in, in various research, and it's just a case then of the direction of the research and uh, where you direct it to go. Well, would you like to see it doubled or tripled, or I mean, do you think... I don't, I don't see any need for that, no. Mr. No. President, could we move on to uh, another area, Central America? Um, uh. You've consistently refused to discuss uh, reports of covert U.S. aid to anti-government forces in Nicaragua. Uh, in recent days, a number of our allies have indicated at the U.N. that they believe the United States is working to overthrow the Nicaraguan government. My question is, why don't you either acknowledge or deny these reports of U.S. activity? Aren't you in danger of losing credibility in the same way that the U.S. government did with its secret war in Cambodia? Well, I think this is something intelligence matters and uh, uh, covert or overt activity, what, uh, whatever, are things that are never discussed, and <clears throat> I'm not going to discuss them now. Um, but we have tried to get along with the government of Nicaragua, and tried from the first. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, uh, they had in uh, these efforts some time ago, uh, when the new revolutionary government was installed, they. Uh, made pledges to us that they would not involve themselves in El Salvador. And uh, we found them in direct violation of that, which they could not deny that they were arming the, the uh, guerrillas in El Salvador. Now, what we're seeing in Nicaragua is the fact that it was a revolution by a coalition of groups that were all opposed to the uh, dictatorial Somoza rule. And as happens so often in that kind of a coalition, when the revolution was over, one faction, and it turned out to be the extreme leftist faction, uh, simply took control and ousted the other revolutionary partners and created a Marxist-Leninist government, <clears throat> openly acknowledging their ties to Cuba and the Soviet Union, openly arming and, and uh, providing weapons to, and supplies to the, and training uh, to the guerrillas in El Salvador. And what we're seeing now are the other revolutionary factions, uh, totally ousted from any participation in the government, and uh, now of fighting back on that. Sir, but my, but my question was, don't you think that the, uh, the recent events at the UN in which our allies have indicated that they don't believe that we are not involved and this continued proliferation of reports from the area that say that there is some involvement, isn't this damaging the credibility of the U.S. government? I don't think so because um, uh, some of the, the few allies who have been critical of this, uh, others of them understand very well, 
what's going on, uh, El Salvador and all, but uh, some of the others have even been critical of our, what we're doing in El Salvador. We have made every effort to point out to them that they've been subjected to quite a wave of uh, worldwide propaganda based on the Salvadoran co uh, conflict. Um, and uh, I think we have convinced a number of them of uh, that what we're doing is, is valid. Mr. President, if I could jump back to our original subjects of relations to the Soviets with a minute, something that you, you said a couple of times that we have three different sets of negotiations going with them. I've been told that at, uh, in one of these sets of negotiations, the United States has proposed modifications of the uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and the Peaceful Nuclear Exchange Treaty to make verica verification in particular and other procedures of carrying those treaties out more effective and that their response was very disappointing to us. Uh, can you confirm yes, that? Yes, this was not one of the three I was thinking of. I was thinking of START, the INF, and then our negotiation on conventional right. weapons. Well, but yes, we had proposed uh, some improvements to the testing a treaty and so forth, and uh, uh, they rejected our proposals. What's your reaction to that? Uh, well, the I think the treaty we're talking about is the uh, test ban yes. treaty. Uh, it isn't all that important because the treaty as it is now, and this is what we want to strengthen, is uh, so restricted as to verification that we have uh, reason to believe that there have been numerous violations, and yet uh, because of the uh, lack of verification <coughs> capacity, uh, we could not make such a charge and sustain it. We just were wanting to improve it so that maybe <coughs> both sides could be sure. So you're considering letting that treaty lapse since it's not uh, no since it's, since that treaty has not done what uh, it's supposed to be doing because of verification problems? Are you considering letting the treaty lapse? Uh, no, as a matter of fact, I think that we've extended it. Mr. President, on defense spending, um, you recently were quoted by your aides and by Senator Domenici saying while you couldn't promise anything, you might be able to show some you might be willing to show some flexibility on defense uh, after the uh, Easter break. Um, the House has cut real growth from 10 percent, your proposal, to 4 percent. Um, communities, people are talking about 7.5 percent. Uh, they're talking about maybe a compromise with the House of 5 to 6 percent. Could you settle for that? Would that be uh, flexible enough? Or could you be flexible? Enough? I think it would be violating uh, what the government is intended to do. Uh, the one prime responsibility of government is to protect the lives and freedom of its citizens. Uh, the budget we submitted and the budget figure we believed was the absolute minimum was necessary to um, continue redressing our defensive capability which had been allowed to deteriorate so badly in the previous decade. Uh, when I spoke to uh, the senators with regard to some flexibility, this was because we were still reviewing every possibility and some things that without uh, actually reducing our capability, that there might be uh, some reason to believe that we could come up with a, with a changed figure, not to the extent they're suggesting changing it. And uh, uh, I don't have the answer, and I can't comment yet. We will, by the time they come back, I think, know whether there is any flexibility or not. I was very careful not to make a promise. and. Uh, Whatever, if we have been able to find uh, this flexibility, we certainly will give them the figure on it. Just to follow up on that, couldn't, I mean, this might be decided for you in a sense, and that, I mean, if the mood of the Congress is that we have to cut below the 10 percent, you're not going to have any choice, are you, sir? Well, I'm going to fight as hard as I can for what we've, uh, what we've proposed in the line of, uh, of a defense buildup. We could not go back down to those figures without uh, reducing our readiness, reducing even the size of our military, the number of men, and without uh, eliminating, cutting back on weapon systems that I believe are necessary. Let me switch back to, to domestic policy, Mr. President. I want to ask you about your, your support for withholding of interest and dividends. Stories running around, or circulating, I should say, that the Republican leaders came down here last week 
and almost pleaded with you to, to bail out on that one. There's some stories to the effect that they told you that if you persist, uh, and if you persist in vetoing it, that you'll, you'll lose an override vote. Is that what they said, and what's your reaction to that? Well, they were telling me what the reaction that they were getting, many people, the mail count and so forth. We have to recognize that there was a very successful lobbying effort going on, still going on for that matter. The truth of the matter is, and I told them, that probably the majority of the people that they were hearing from as opposed to this were people who were actually so misled that they believed that either this was a new tax being imposed um, or that they were all going to be victimized in great losses in their interest and so forth. Well, it isn't a new tax. Interest and dividends are taxed now. We are only asking for withholding of this tax in order to close a, a gap through which people who legitimately owe a tax are able to uh, avoid payment. But Mr. President, of that if, it looked tax. Like, if it looked like you were going to lose on that fight and you're, you could veto it and it would be overridden, would you agree to some other way to close that gap, for instance, to hiring more uh, IRS agents? <clears throat> Well, the thing is, we, before we ever came up with the proposal was when we explored all those ways, and the cost was so tremendous. It's a, it gets down in this age of computers to a really hand-to-hand -hand personal comparison of, of reports and so forth. We're talking anywhere from five to seven and a half billion dollars a year that is being lost. But the other thing that the people don't realize yet, and we're going to try to, to inform them as much as we can, they don't realize that the bulk of these people who are protesting are not going to be affected. We're not withholding on the bulk of, uh, of dividend and, and interest uh, holdings because we have set uh, a limit below which we don't go. And where the senior citizens are concerned, and they are very much concerned because so many of them now are counting on savings and so forth. Um, where they're concerned, they're not going to be affected at all. They're exempt. So there's a, only a limited number of people. Now the other thing is this fear of some loss of return on their interest. Someone with $10,000 of savings and a 9% interest rate, the Withholding of their interest a little in advance, as this would, as this would do, um, thus maybe reducing the compound interest <clears throat> return, would amount to about $4 and a quarter a year on a savings account of $10,000, 9% interest. Mr. President, we're going to talk to going on television uh, to make your case on this, uh, as you did on the... Uh, another subject the other night? Well, I don't know. We haven't, we've, we've talked about all the things we can do. We're trying to refute this. I've been encouraged uh, uh, by some surveying that's been done that revealed that um, uh, the people out there are more evenly split than, than they seem to realize. Uh, the only trouble is they're only hearing from one side. We're Mr. trying to get them to hear from the other side. We're down to, the, we're down to some short time here, sir. Uh, I wonder if you could tell me, one, do you consider Jim Watt a political liability? As, as Ferenkoff said yesterday, we had lunch, and he said that, uh, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, Watt was a political liability right now. Do you see Jim Watt a, as that? No, I don't. And what I see is very necessary is that a perception that has, has been created that is absolutely false. I will match this administration's record with regard to environmental matters against that of any other administration. And we have been much far more successful. We're spending more money on parks and on acquisition of parks and so forth than the previous administration had spent in all its four years in these two so far. And I think what Jim Watt is the victim of is not the rank and file out there of environmentalists. I think I'm one. Uh, but the victim of those professionals in some of the various organizations uh, who make me wonder sometimes uh, whether they really want the problem solved 
or whether uh, they haven't recognized that as long as they can keep the people impressed that there is a problem, their careers will go on. I have one other quick one, Mr. President. On the decontrol of natural gas, you want that. Yeah. But utilities are, are really legal monopolies. There is no competition, so to speak. I mean, prices don't come down like they do for sugar or coffee or anything else. Would you be opposed to the legislation that is now going around on the Hill to postpone from 1985 to 1987 the decontrol of half the natural gas supply and also roll back the prices? No, we've made a proposal and it's based on the fact that we decontrol. They went down because there was an immediate upsurge of, of exploration and development of, of oil. We think the same thing is going to happen because today there are great supplies of natural gas that under controls are sealed, are kept they're in the ground and they're not use it, utilizing them because of the price controls and their low price gas. And uh, we also have in our legislation a provision against passing on any increases. Somebody's went click. Well, this one will get it. Um, that, that we have a, a, a provision in that that they cannot pass on a, a, a tax increase. But you'll also find out there at the state level, most states recognizing utilities are basically a monopoly. Uh, you have public utilities commissions with authority at the state level to regulate prices. If I could, if I could just ask one quick question. Uh, without talking about your own re-election plans, do you think that it, does it cause you any concern that this country has had a succession of presidents who uh, have not been reelected to a, have not been reelected to a second term. The succession of one-term presidents is that the cause of any concern? Do you think? I have read many people who <laughs> say it is, and uh, I have to say yes. I, I think it. I think it is, because I think it creates an instability, um, and uh, it should be uh, the whole subject should be looked at. They're having been eight years in, uh, as a governor, and this isn't in any way to tip off what I may or may not do because it's going to have to depend on each individual and whether uh, that individual thinks they continue to be uh, effective in the job. But uh, you really can't in four years uh, carry through uh, programs that may be necessary. One super quick question here. Since you've just talked a little bit about POWs and MIAs, uh, you signed a proclamation for next week. Do you personally believe any American servicemen from Vietnam are still alive in Southeast Asia? I don't think we can afford to believe there aren't. And I know that this is the attitude that the Defense Department is taking also. The, uh, we do know that there are some more than 2,000, close to 2,500 around there. Uh, names of individuals missing in action, but there's no record. And a number of those, there have been returned prisoners who say that they had seen them, they saw them alive, they knew they were there. And uh, I think we have to, we just have to keep on following every lead. I think also there may be uh, some people who might have voluntarily chosen uh, to stay. And uh, all of this, we just have to keep after it with every resource that we can devote to it. Well, we're not going to keep after it, but uh, on this subject, we appreciate it very much, Mr. President, the chance to chat with you. Hope uh, well, some of our colleagues will have a chance to do it again. One oh, I hope so too, and uh, I'll look forward to do it myself. I know there's a lot of subjects we didn't get to, but I know also that uh, we're over time, aren't we? Right. All right. Thanks again, Mr. President. Okay. Thank you.